On those days when you are deeply concerned about the next generation and the future of our planet, it may do you some good to think about Maya Berhanprakar. Maya is a 17-year-old high school student, but that barely begins to describe her interests. She's a scientist, an entrepreneur, a volunteer, and will begin the next school year doing her undergrad studies at Harvard University. And we welcome Maya Berhanprakar to the agenda. It's so nice to meet you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let's just find out a little bit about you before we find out about your interests. Where are you from? I am from Horseshoe Valley, which is a bit north of here. And your parents are from where? Uh, they're both originally from India, but they've been living in Canada for quite a while now. You got any brothers and sisters? Nope, only child. It's just you. Yep. Have you had, how normal would you describe your childhood as? I mean, I thought it was normal. I don't really have anything to compare it to. <laughs> well, you, got, um, uh, you went to school with a bunch of people. That's true. I think that, that my interests sort of were a bit different than, than other people, and that's, that, that, that shaped my childhood. Um, so I know, I remember with my parents, we used to go to the local public library, and they would encourage me to get anything I wanted, whether those were documentaries or Disney princess movies or um, the big hung Hungry Caterpillar books, those kinds of things. Uh, and I would always gravitate towards watching documentaries about, about space and the universe and those kinds of things, or reading nonfiction books. Um, I remember I used to be able to name every single kind of dinosaur. I used to be able to know all of the different kinds of dump trucks and tractors and construction vehicles. Um, I think I sort of peaked at around six years old, actually, now that I think about it. <laughs> well, do you think you are that way? Uh, you know, we love this nature versus nurture discussion. Is, is that just the way you, your DNA works? So from a scientific perspective, I really feel that I shouldn't answer that question because I have no idea. Um, but at the same time, I definitely think that you don't need to be a genius in any way. I guess genetically, you don't need to be a genius to be able to do these kinds of things. Um, I really think that it comes down to interest and passion and hard work. And if you have those things, then everything else will sort of fall into place. You got elected as a student school board trustee. Which yeah. board? Uh, the Simcoe County School Board. And what do you have to do to be that? You, so you have to get elected, you have to be nominated from your school, uh, and then after that you go to a board-wide election, and then uh, there are three people who are selected from that process. So did you actually run and get votes, or you got picked? Yes, uh, so at my school I just got picked, but then after that I had to run against all of the other nominees from the other high schools. And do you go to the trustee meetings? Yeah, yeah. You get a vote on council? No, we only get we only get input, but you get to we, don't say. Get to, we don't get to vote. I see, okay. But I think, I think that has a lot of power to be able to Say yeah, you're at the table. Yeah. Good for you. Uh, I also hear you were a, a student advisor to the Minister of Education. I was, Which back minister? in elementary school. That was Laurel Broughton. Laurel Broughton. So a long time ago. Yes. <laughs> okay. And can you recall any advice that you gave her that um, she may have taken? Um, I like to think that she took my advice. I know that the curriculum sort of went in that direction afterwards. So I like to think it was me, but I know more realis realistically it probably wasn't. But I was talking about two things. Uh, one was student engagement and increasing student engagement by um, reaching out to rural communities, for example, the community that I'm from, and making sure that everyone has equal access to opportunities. Opportunities. And the other thing was much more science focused and it was just improving science curriculum by introducing more modern research and more hands-on learning and that kind of thing. Now when you give that advice to a politician who's twice or three times your age, do they ever say mind your own damn business kid or anything like that? <laughs> Well, thankfully, I was a part of a cohort with, I believe, 60 other students. So she would have had to say that to every single one of us if she wanted to do that. And she did. She didn't. Okay, no. <laughs> just confirming. Maya, you play the piano? I do. You yeah. ski? Yes. Snowboard? Yes. Alpine hike? Yes. You play hockey? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you know, all those other things are very interesting, but how do you not play hockey? Oh, I just never, I did figure skating when I was little. Oh, okay, well, that's on ice. That's okay. <laughs> now, it says on your website that you were awarded a University of Toronto National Scholarship, a TD National Scholarship, and a National Schulich Scholarship. Yes. And declined them all? I did, yeah. Why? Um, well, I decided in the end, they were all fantastic schools. Canada has so many amazing opportunities to offer. But in the end, I decided to go to the States, um, where they have more of a liberal arts philosophy than they do here. So for example, if I went to school here, I would have been straight into computer engineering as soon as on day one, basically. Um, whereas in America, there's more opportunity in your first and second year to explore a wide range of fields. Is that really and, true? And there's so really many good liberal arts that. universities here. How can that be true? <laughs> I'm not meaning to second guess your choice. That's your, you know, obviously it's your choice. So you're going to go to Harvard. I am, yeah. And study what in first year? 
So I'm not entirely sure, but right now I'm leaning towards doing a double major in electrical engineering and physics, and maybe doing some computer science along the way as well. Holy Toledo. <laughs> you see that board there? You're yeah. the only person in this building who can make head or tail of what's on that video <laughs> board right now. I'm just telling you. OK, shall we get into some of your discoveries here? I read that you prototyped an intelligent antibiotic at the age of 12. So let's go through that. What's an intelligent antibiotic? So essentially the idea was that conventional antibiotics are a very broad spectrum, which means they kill all bacteria, regardless of whether it's good or bad for you. And as you may know, there's a lot of really helpful bacteria inside of your body that we need to function. Um, and so that is part of the reason that we end up with so many side effects when we take conventional antibiotics. It's because they wipe out the stuff inside of us that's good for us. And so when I was little, I kind of thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to come up with something that would kill the bad bacteria, but not the good bacteria? And that was the basis for developing developing this intelligent antibiotic. And you figured that out? Well, you know, I think when people say, I developed an intelligent antibiotic, it sounds a bit more complicated than it actually was. So this was actually a three-year process that started when I was in grade five and ended when I was in grade seven. Um, and essentially, I started out with a, a, I decided that I was going to make this intelligent antibiotic. And so what I did was I took a, a pop can cooler um, and I put an electric heating blanket inside of it, and that was gonna be my incubator. I then, as my bacterial source, took a piece of raw chicken my parents were cooking for dinner and left it out on the deck for a few days. I used that as the bacterial source, which is definitely very unsafe, and no one should ever do that. Um, but I did that, and then I sort of dumped a bunch of herbs that I thought would be uh, good, good antibiotic agents, according to tra traditional Indian medicine. Um, and, and when I opened the cooler up a few days later, it turned out that there was no bacteria there, and I thought, hooray, I found an intelligent antibiotic. So I took that research to the local science fair, and I presented it. And the judge said, you know, Maya, good job, but you realize the bacteria didn't die because of the herbs. They died because you suffocated them. <laughs> <laughs> So I was back to the drawing board the next year, and, and so I improved my method slightly. I got in touch with a local high school science teacher, which was really scary because I was only in elementary school at the time. And, and I, I asked if I could borrow like an actual incubator and a, a real proper bacterial source and that kind of thing. And so every year I kind of slowly improved my methods until finally in that very last year I did something useful. But there were definitely a lot of stumbling blocks along the way. But is this to say that some point down the road you may actually like sell the patent to a big pharma company and this will become a real thing? Well, I certainly hope it would. Um, that would be the goal. But as, as is the case with most bio biological research, it takes a long time for it to get to that stage and a lot of money as well. And that was something that as a 12-year-old I wasn't really capable of doing. But I certainly hope something comes of it in the future. Gotcha. Okay, next thing. You are currently launching a tech startup that uses low-cost telepresence technology to do what? So essentially, this is an idea, again, child Maya had a while ago. Um, and that was the idea that, well, doctors become doctors because they care about helping other people. But the problem with organizations like um, the Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders is that it's really hard for doctors to pack up for weeks or months at a time, leave their practices and their families, and go to a foreign country to respond to a disaster. Um, and so I was thinking, well, why don't we just use video conferencing technology to solve this problem and essentially create this global network of doctors and medical workers who are available 24-7 to respond to any, any disaster that might occur. And, um, and so I was, I was talking to someone at the African Medical, uh, or, or the um, uh, at AMREF Health Africa, which is, is one of the international medical aid organizations. And she was saying, well, this sounds like a great idea. So we tried out a lot of things. We tried out using Skype and FaceTime, and there were always lots of issues. Um, like they weren't operating well enough in the low bandwidth environments, or they were too complicated, too many login procedures and profiles. And I mean, my grandmother, for example, she lives in, Af in India, and she cannot use Skype. She would not figure that out. I've tried to, exp I've showed it to her so many times whenever I go there, but she still can't do it just because there are so many buttons to press. Um, and so I decided that I was going to, uh, with a couple of friends, create a, my own video conferencing technology that specifically addressed this issue. And you did that? Yeah, yeah. And what do you want to see that turn into? Well, ideally, it would be what I was talking about earlier, that global network of doctors and, and nurses who can respond to any crisis at any time. And you think that can happen? I think it could happen. I think there is a lot more infrastructure and logistics that need to be organized first, but we're starting pilot trials soon, and so hopefully that will go well. Uh, let's talk about the STEMs. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. For the longest time, 
this was a realm of boys only and girls were well behind. Yes. Where are we at now in that? I think we've made a huge amount of progress. Uh, just looking at enrollment statistics, for example, in universities, it's been shown that girls are certainly getting more involved than before. But there's still a lot of work to be done, of course. So when you go to Harvard in the fall, and you're obviously taking a couple of these STEM areas of yes. discipline, what percentage of the class that you're about to go into do you think will be female? Uh, I don't have statistics on hand, but I know not a lot. Would it be more than 10%? Uh, I think so. Uh, I, I'm really not. I don't have the statistics mm. on hand, as I said. But I think with electrical engineering, I, I think there are usually around 15 to 20 students and um, single-digit females, low single digits. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, true or false, not everybody is hardwired to understand this stuff. So again, I want to give the scientific response, which is I have no idea, <laughs> so I don't feel I can answer the question. Um, but at the same time, I think that for me, I don't know if I, if I did have some sort of predisposition or aptitude for the sciences, per se. Um, I just know that I was always really interested in learning things and asking questions, and then that sort of lent itself to the sciences really nicely. Um, and, and because I was really enthusiastic and passionate about it, that made me more willing to put in those late nights studying calculus and, and, and physics and all of these uh, subjects that have really hard concepts within them. But because I was interested, I kept on pursuing them. Maya, because you're already 17 and haven't done very much with your life, um, <laughs> we want to point out here that uh, you've gone up north. You went to yes. the Canadian and Greenlandic Arctic to witness climate change firsthand. And not only that, but you made a documentary about it. We're going to play a little snippet of that documentary right now and then come back and chat. Sheldon, roll it, please. On May 2, 2013, just after nightfall, Scientific instruments on an island in Hawaii recorded carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere at 400 parts per million. The last time carbon dioxide levels were this high, Homo sapiens did not live there. In fact, the last time carbon dioxide levels were this high was more than 2.5 million years ago. Back then, lush forests filled the Canadian Arctic instead of these icebergs. It was a time when the land bridge connecting North America had just recently formed, and North America's present coastlines were submerged by five meters of seawater. Maya, when did you go there? Uh, back in the summer of 2013. And what did you see that particularly disturbed you? So I think when I went to the Arctic, I was really most excited from a kind of ecotourism perspective. So I had never seen icebergs or polar bears or anything like that before, and I was really excited to have the chance to do so. But what's interesting about the Arctic, especially as compared to the Antarctic, is that there are people who actually live there. Um, and, and what really broke my heart were the stories that those people had to tell. Um, and so, for example, one village that we visited was a fishing community on, on the coast of Greenland. And there were people there who, because of climate change, um, could no longer fish. And this was, this was a community that was based almost entirely upon fishing. And because of that, they had completely lost their, their livelihoods, and there were children who were actually starving because of climate change that they did almost nothing to cause. Hmm. And that just shocked me. I think that in school, we often learn about statistics, you know, that uh, global temperatures will rise Y degrees, or sea levels will rise X number of centimeters. But we don't learn that there are real people out there today who are being impacted by climate change. And I think that because of that, climate change to a lot of young people has become more of a buzzword than something that actually needs action. And so what I really wanted to do was to be able to share those stories that I was told and share the human side of climate change um, in the hopes that that would mobilize my generation to take action. I heard you make a reference in the piece to 400 parts per million. Yes. What does that refer to? So it's interesting, actually, uh, because at the time that that was made, it was, it was referring to the May 2013 event where carbon dioxide levels at a particular, uh, particularly historic uh, observatory in Hawaii first reached 400 parts per million. Um, but as you might know, very recently we hit a far more scary I landmark. probably don't know, so oh. don't, don't assume. Anyway, keep going. Uh, well, well, recently we, we hit another extremely scary landmark, which was that global, globally we have surpassed 400 parts per million in carbon dioxide levels, which is, uh, it's, it's interesting that the name of my documentary has taken on a very different meaning now. Because it's, it's just called 400 ppm? Yes. You've got Chris Hadfield, you've got Margaret Atwood, you've got Wade Davis, 
all in this documentary. Yes. How did you get them to participate? Um, a lot of interesting coincidences. Uh, so <laughs> at one point, uh, my, my dad was on a hiking trip and Wade Davis happened to be there. And I went, oh my goodness, you have to talk to him. I really want him to be in my documentary. Um, and he was down for that. So one day when he was in Toronto, I, I cornered him in a hotel room for a couple of hours and asked him questions. Um, and then with, with Margaret Atwood, I happened to be speaking at a conference, a writer's conference that was going on in Barrie. And uh, I was giving a keynote address, and so was she. And uh, I was talking about climate change, and, and I guess she was interested in what I had to say. And, and then I asked her to be a part of the documentary. And then Chris Hadfield I was talking to about some other unrelated aerospace research. Uh, and and he, I know that he's also very enthusiastic about, about doing something about climate change. And so I emailed him as well and got him on board with that. I don't necessarily want to draw you into a political discussion, but the reality <laughs> is uh, the United States of America has just elected a man to be their president who believes that climate change is a hoax invented by the Chinese to render American businesses less competitive. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether you have any thoughts about, um, well, about how well we're going to tackle this problem going forward given that view. Um, it definitely wasn't the result that I was hoping for. And I think that it's hard for me to definitively say anything just because uh, the president-elect, he, he's untested, so we don't know how he'll respond to, to whatever comes his way. But uh, what, what does scare me is, is, is how little facts have informed policy for, for him. And I think that that's, uh, when, when you just blatantly disregard what the vast, overwhelming majority of the scientific community is, is, is saying is happening, uh, that's extremely scary. Because when you start applying that, not just to climate change, but to any issue, when, when, when facts stop informing policy, then policy becomes useless. Hmm. I want to ask you one last question, which is going to sound incredibly patronizing. But I ask every teenager this question, so don't take it the wrong way. <laughs> What do you want to be when you grow up? Oh my goodness, I have absolutely <laughs> no idea. As you can probably tell from my background, I'm interested in absolutely everything, mm. whether within the realm of the sciences alone. Um, I've done work in microbiology, neurodegenerative disease. Uh, more recently, I've been working in, in fundamental physics and robotics engineering, of all things. So my interests are definitely all over the place. Um, and then as well, not just in sciences, but I really like doing my work with the Minister of Education and, and guiding science policy and that kind of thing as well. So I have no idea what specifically I'm gonna end up doing, but I think that it would be really nice to be having some sort of positive impact on the world, whether that's through policy or actual research I'm doing in the lab. So one thing we know, it's four years at Harvard? Yes. And then you'll no doubt go for a master's after that. Surely. And then a PhD. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> you've probably got the next decade going to universities somewhere in the world. <laughs> probably not all of them in Boston either. Probably not. No. Maya, it's so great to meet you. And um, wow, I feel so much better about the future having just talked to you. Oh, that's, that's very nice. Well, so thank very you very nice much for coming into TVO tonight and sharing your views with us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Maya Burhan Prakar. Thanks, Maya. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.